The U.S. launches airstrikes in Afghanistan, targeting a key figure in recent attacks and avenging the 13 service members killed. He was trying to, to do the right thing. A 72-year-old man shot and killed outside his home. Police say he was interrupting the crime and his children are at a loss. Not being able to call him right now is probably the hardest thing for me. Plus, two Boulder County deputies are found guilty of manslaughter. It makes me feel like I'm doing everything I can to protect myself. And Coloradans roll up their sleeves for a third time. They can protect me, they can protect themselves, they can protect children. And we begin tonight with breaking news out of Afghanistan. U.S. forces have carried out airstrikes against the Islamic State. The military says a drone took out an ISIS-K militant who was believed to be planning more attacks. A U.S. official says there is no link, though, between Thursday's suicide bombing and this person who was killed. And we are also told there were no civilian casualties. 13 U.S. service members and more than 150 Afghan civilians were killed on Thursday. The White House warned today that more attacks are likely. At least 500 U.S. citizens are still trying to get out of Afghanistan and return to the U.S. The athletic director at Chatfield High School has been ordered to appear in court on a charge of failure to report child abuse or neglect. A.D. Craig Auckland and Principal Trad Brower were placed on administrative leave earlier this week. Neither the Jeffco School District nor the DA's office is elaborating on the investigation. Two now former Boulder County deputies have been convicted of manslaughter in the death of a 23 year old man. James O'Brien and Adam Lund knew Demetrius Shankling was heavily intoxicated when they put him face down in a transport van in 2018. Shankling lost consciousness and died and an autopsy showed he could not breathe because of how his body was positioned. O'Brien and Lund will be sentenced November 4th and they're looking at between two and six years in prison. Well, an arrest made in the shooting of a 72-year-old man in Broomfield. 22-year-old Joseph Maestra Sanchez is accused of shooting Michael Lewis early Wednesday morning, and tonight he's being held without bond. And today, Denver 7 CB Cotton sat down with Lewis's children, who say their dad was trying to protect the neighborhood. This is my oldest daughter and I and my dad. These photos tell the story of a father who loved his kids and the people around him. This was our, my senior year. He got voted most supportive male parent that year. Alyssa and Sean say their father, Michael Lewis, carried that kind of love to their children, his grandkids. He wanted to know what they were doing, where they were, if he could go <laughs> to whatever they were doing. But there's one chapter in Michael Lewis's story that no one saw coming. I don't, I don't think anybody thinks this could ever happen to someone you know. Michael was shot and killed Wednesday morning after police say he confronted a man who was breaking into cars. He was trying to to do the right thing, to to look out for look out for their for your neighbors, and he he paid the ultimate price for that. I think he would do it again, even if he knew the outcome. Protecting others, second nature for the Army veteran, occasional coach. My brother and I both did track, and he, he wiggled his way into helping coach track in high school. Member of the 10th Mountain Division Reenactment Group. He did this a lot. This was his other passion when he wasn't with our kids or with us. And high school softball fan. Today they had a game, and they put a chair out there for him in right field because that's where he sat. Michael lived 72 extraordinary years. He was kind. He was loving. He was the one that we always knew we could look up to for guidance and for just support. His kids just wish he could have been here for a few more. I love you. And I wish you were here. CB Cotton, Denver 7. What a loss. And friends have launched a GoFundMe account to support that family. And we put a link to that on the denverchannel.com. 793 people are spending the night in a Colorado hospital with a confirmed or suspected case of COVID-19. Nearly 1,500 of the state's 1,700 ICU beds are in use. At 86%, that is the highest occupancy rate of the pandemic. The state says at this rate, about one in 10 Colorado hospitals expects to be short on beds next week. So with beds filling up, Colorado hospitals are reactivating tier one of the combined hospital transfer center. This allows hospitals to transfer patients to other facilities that have more capacity. Hospitals previously used this system between last November and this past February. A CDC study released earlier this week said that unvaccinated people are 29 times more likely to be hospitalized with COVID. 
And taking a look now at the vaccination process here in Colorado, 67% of all eligible people are fully immunized. 74% have gotten at least one dose. And vaccinated Coloradans will soon be rolling up their sleeves again. People who got their second shot eight months ago become eligible for a third on September 20th. Immune compromised people are already getting that extra dose. Denver 7's Eddie Guajardo spoke with a transplant recipient who received her shot today. Donna Bolt is used to hospitals. She's a former nurse and patient. Came here and was diagnosed with um, liver disease. Her son David stepped in 13 years ago as her donor. But now Donna has the Delta variant, a more contagious strain to worry about. It's a lot easier for any kind of virus or bacteria or something to invade my system than it would be for it to invade someone else's system. As an organ transplant recipient, she's immunocompromised, a population that includes cancer patients, stem cell transplant recipients, and people with HIV. Immunocompromised people make up 3% of the population and account for a large portion of breakthrough cases. To help protect them against COVID-19, the FDA authorized a third dose. And that's great. Dr. Thomas Campbell with UC uh, Health says uh, people with weak immune systems desperately need the boost in protection. First two doses never get them to the level that they need. Getting that third dose will get more of them to that uh, to the level that's needed. UC Health started rolling out the third shot for people who fall into the first two vaccine phases. Donna? Yes. All right. And Donna signed up right away. She walked right into UC Health, and within minutes, three little poke. the Pfizer vaccine went right in. How are you feeling? About the same way I felt when I walked in the door, just fine. <laughs> the extra protection, adding a pep in her step. It makes me feel like I'm doing everything I can to protect myself. Addie Guardo, Denver 7. And just to be clear here, there is a difference between an additional vaccine dose and a booster dose. Going in depth here, according to the CDC, an additional dose is given to people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised and who did not build up enough protection after they were initially vaccinated. When it comes to a booster, the CDC says that refers to another dose of a vaccine given to someone who built enough protection after vaccination, but that protection lessened over time. So how many Coloradans have received a third dose so far? Well, Denver 7 asked the state, who said more than 22,700 people have gotten their third dose. That number does not include people who skirted the system to receive a third shot. And let's take a look at the CDC's guidance on boosters. So starting mid-September, Third shots will be offered to adults who received their second dose of either Pfizer or Moderna at least eight months earlier. Those who received the Johnson & Johnson will likely need boosters too, but guidance on that is expected not until the next few weeks or so. And President Biden also suggested today there are discussions of offering boosters as early as five months after the second dose. Tonight, though, again, the official policy is eight months. And COVID cases are rising among younger Coloradans. The state says people under the age of 19 made up 27% of cases this week. And Children's Hospital Colorado tells Denver 7 they are seeing more COVID patients there. They say pediatric ICU beds are 60% above normal and COVID is a large contributor. Another case of COVID-19 reported at STEM School Highlands Ranch. This time, it's a staff member. In a letter to parents, the school said the speech pathologist had tested positive and that anyone who saw him on Tuesday could have been exposed to the virus. Multiple STEM students have contracted COVID. First through sixth grade is currently being taught online. Another Colorado school district is issuing a mask mandate for students. The Greeley Evans District 6 school board passed a motion this evening and it requires masks for all students, staff and visitors at pre-K through 8th grade schools starting on Monday. The board says they hope the change will keep students out of quarantine and in the classroom. Cherry Creek Schools expanding its mask mandate to older grades starting Monday. Cherry Creek students in 7th and 8th now will need to mask up. The superintendent says the district has not seen significant spread, but that community spread is the reason for this decision. CCSD was already required uh, requiring masks for students in pre-K through sixth grade. And Denver is offering help now to renters facing eviction. Last night, the Supreme Court rejected the nationwide eviction moratorium, leaving millions of people in jeopardy of being kicked out of their homes. 
The Denver Department of Housing Stability is offering rent and utility assistance to households that meet these income guidelines. The department's also working with nonprofits to provide some legal help. And while millions of renters fear eviction, landlords have a side of the story too. Landlords we spoke with today say they're willing to work with renters who are behind on payments, but they also add they also have to make a living here. We now have more details about the memorial service for former Governor Dick Lamb, who died late last month. The service will be held on Tuesday at 3.30 at Wings over the Rockies Museum. It is open to the public with masks required. Governor Polis will speak. Former Denver Mayor Bellington Webb will give the eulogy. And former First Lady Dottie Lamb will also offer remarks. Dick Lamb was 85 and died following complications from a pulmonary embolism. This should not be happening right now. Coming up, a Gold Star mom on leaving Afghanistan and life after loss. We're all suffering the same, the same pain all over again. We could see strong thunderstorms across parts of Colorado on Saturday, but what about the Bronco game? I'll have that forecast for you coming up. And New Orleans hunkers down and awaits Hurricane Ida's arrival. And now to that breaking news, you heard the Amber Alert. It's just been issued out of Colorado Springs for this little girl. She's a 21 month old. Asario Glover is believed to be with Arthur Lee Glover. And Arthur Lee Glover is a 50 year old man who police say is armed, dangerous, and has a history of domestic violence. Again, this is out of Colorado Springs, so anyone with information should call 911 immediately. Today we learned one of the service members killed in Kabul was a Marine from Wyoming. Riley McCullum grew up in the small town of Bondurant, about 45 minutes south of Jackson. According to the Associated Press, McCullum's wife is expecting their first child. Wyoming Senator John Barrasso honored McCullum in a statement calling him a true American hero. He says Riley wasted no time answering the call to serve our country, joining Marines right out of high school. As Riley's dad once said, he was full blooded, red, white and blue. Well, 2400 U.S. service members have died in Afghanistan over the last 20 years and each led to serve for different reasons. Their family left to cope in different ways. And what they share is a pain understood by few and a sense of pride that carries them through both good days and bad. Here with tonight's story is Denver 7's Sean Toll. We wish we could believe it was unavoidable. Cindy Dietz Marsh knows the pain of war. It's, it's been tough. And she knows it doesn't go away. Every minute of every day, I 
miss my son. Her son, Navy SEAL Danny Dietz, was killed in 2005 while fighting in Afghanistan, an ambush chronicled in the film Lone Survivor. Shot me. In his hometown of Littleton, a statue sits in his honor. Part of Santa Fe Drive is known as Danny Dietz Memorial Highway. This means the most to me. Absolutely. And then there's Cindy carrying on his memory. He went out there doing a job that he was signed up to do, and he did it very well. And although he lost his life, it, it, it was not in vain. Cindy says her son would have been disappointed with how the withdrawal has been handled. I think he would probably go against orders and he would, he would serve and protect. And though she believes it's time for the U.S. to depart Afghanistan, she's disappointed as well. I'm angry at, at choices made from, from our commander in chief and, and the rest in office that you know, are making these, these choices, these decisions that I believe are wrong, so very wrong. Tonight, she'll fall asleep thinking of her son. And I know one day, will be joined as one again. And 13 others who died this week making the same sacrifice. 13 doorbells are ringing today. 13 flags will be folded. 13 pairs of ha trembling hands will soon accept those flags besides the grave of their husband or wife or son or daughter who lost their life in Afghanistan. Sean Toll, Denver 7.